Hello. In the past few lectures, we've been working with a system of linear equations or an arbitrary ring. We tried to use the same method as we did for fields, meaning using um, an analog of the Gauss Jordan elimination process over an arbitrary ring. And we had a fairly good success for Euclidean domains. Along the way, we also developed and studied module theory a bit. Now we want to go back and um, try to see how we can generalize the questions that we have been studying so far. For a long time, we have been studying single variable polynomials over a field. Then we looked at linear equations over a ring. Now there are two possible ways that we can extend our studies. Either we can work with uh, a single variable polynomial and try to solve it over a ring, or we can go to multi-dimensional setting and try to solve a system of uh, polynomial equations over a field. So we are going to do both of them, but as you can see, because ring of multivariable polynomials uh, are successive ring of polynomials over single variable, um, single variables. So for instance, if I give you a uh, ring of polynomials in n variables, you can view it as ring of polynomials in the last variable x sub n over the ring of polynomials with n minus one variables, as, as I've written it over here. So it is not surprising that if we have a good understanding of ring of polynomials with a single variable or an arbitrary ring, then that has implications for the second problem, mean, meaning studying zeros of a multivariable polynomial over a field. So that's why we start with the first question. What can we say about ring of polynomials with coefficients in a given unit of commutative ring? We want to understand ring theoretic properties of a bracket X where A uh, is such a unit of commutative ring. Let's recall some of the results that we have already proved. We have already proved that F bracket X is a Euclidean domain and therefore it's a principal ideal domain. If F is a field. In fact, we also showed the converse of this statement that if F bracket X is a PID, then F is a field. We also discussed that using the fact that uh, the product of degrees would be summation of degree of the polynomials, assuming that there are no zero divisors in our uh, coefficient ring, meaning it's, a, it's an integral domain, if D is an integral domain, then using this degree equation, we show that DX is also a Euclidean domain. So being a field implies that uh, F bracket X is a PID. Being a domain implies that D bracket X is still a domain. We also produced, proved Gauss's lemma and then used it as a, as a, as a tool. Um, and use the first item as well in order to show that if D is a unique factorization domain, then um, D bracket X is also a unique factorization domain. Okay, so these are the results of this nature that given some information about A, we could prove some, we could prove some information, some ring theoretic property of A bracket X. And one of the key results behind all these uh, statements, so of course it was the first one, and that one was being a Euclidean domain, and being a Euclidean domain means we needed to have a long division, and long division was one of the key results that helped us obtain these statements. Let me recall the most general statement uh, that we proved about long division. We show that if we start with a unital commutative ring, if I give you a polynomial G in A bracket X, with the property that its leading coefficient is a unit in A, 
then we can divide an arbitrary other polynomial in a bracket x by g, get a unique quotient and a unique remainder. And what does that mean? So given f, I can write down f as a product of g, which means an element inside the ideal generated by g, plus a remainder, where the degree of the remainder, when we say it's remainder, it means that its degree is less than degree of g. And these pairs are, this pair of q, quotient, and remainder r, are unique. Again, the whole thing holds under the assumption that the leading coefficient of g is a unit. So in that case, we are getting a unique cosec representative for the ideal generated by, so here we have that this is in ideal generated by G, so maybe I write it with blue, and we are, what we are saying is that F minus so f plus this ideal, this coset, is r plus this ideal. So that means we have a method of um, finding a simple coset representative in the quotient of a bracket x by the ideal generated by g. In particular, uh, an element belongs to the ideal generated by g precisely when its remainder is 0. Okay, so this is a long division and let's recall how the proof of the long, of long division went. So essentially we had this type of algorithm that could help us to show the existence of Q and R inductively. At least the existence, the uniqueness was a different argument, but for the existence part, we essentially followed the following algorithm. We kind of, went by strong induction on the degree of f and and this algorithm was behind uh, the proof of the existence what is it so we say if degree of f is already smaller than degree of g then we are done just return f as the remainder and whatever you have achieved so far for the quotient so we just return whatever we have achieved so far for the quotient Initially, we set Q to be zero, and then we change it through this algorithm. So whatever we have achieved so far, we return as Q, and the remainder would be F in this case. Now, what if degree of F is at least degree of G? Then that means I can match the leading term of F. So what does that mean? Then because degree of f is at least degree of g, I can match the power of x part of leading term of f. So I can multiply it by x to power degree of f minus degree of g to match the x part of the leading term. And the leading coefficient would be also a multiple of the leading coefficient of g because we have assumed that leading coefficient of g is a unit inside A, we can always find some C inside A so that the leading coefficient of F is C times the leading coefficient of G. So altogether, we get the existence of a monomial C times X to the K so that the leading coefficient is the leading term of G times this monomial is the same as the leading term of F. Now, having this monomial c x to the k, I can um, produce a new quotient and a new function that I want to divide by. So instead of the old uh, quotient, I'm going to update it. And the new quotient would be the old one plus this new um, monomial. And the new function that I'm going to divide, f new, would be the old one minus this monomial times g. And we notice that because the leading term of the old one matches the leading term of this product, and uh, I'm subtracting them out, 
the degree of the f nu is strictly less than the degree of the old f. So I'm actually in this process, I'm reducing degree of f. So that means at some point, I'm going to get to step one and then it spills out a quotient and a remainder. Now, notice that when it spills out this quotient and remainder, that's exactly what we needed. Why? Because in this process, as we do this f new and f old, we never, um, we never change. So you see then f new, let me write it over here. As you can see, f new is always the same mod g. So I'm not changing this coset, uh, the coset of f plus the ideal generated by g. I'm, I'm always in that coset. Within that coset, I am reducing the degree of the coset representative. Till I reach to a coset representative whose degree is strictly less than degree of g. So as a result, we definitely get the remainder and this q is always updated. So whatever I'm subtracting by now, whatever I'm subtracting by now, So dropping the G I'm adding to the quotient. So this means when I multiply this guy by G and add the F new, I get the old F. So all together, we get that, um, we get the long division algorithm and why the existence part of the long division algorithm works. Now, if you think about it, the key property that enabled us to come up with this algorithm is the following, that we can always clean up the leading term. We can always match it. We can always find it as a multiple of the leading term of G. So the key point has been that the leading term of F is indeed a multiple of leading term of G, unless the degree is small, unless degree of F is strictly less than degree of g. So unless I'm in the realm of remaining, I can always match it, match up the leading term and clean it and go to a smaller degree. That's, that's the key uh, point uh, in this algorithm. Now, you want to generalize this line, line of logic. We know that when I go to a bracket x and not in a bracket x, um, the, I, it has not all the ideals are principal. It has ideals that are generated by uh, not a single G, but rather G1, G2, da, 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 Gn. So if I want to understand a simple coset representative for an ideal, then I need to have a generalized long division where I divide not only by a single G, but rather by a G1, da, 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 Gn so to speak. So I want to divide out by an ideal um, and find a simple coset representative. But from this ideal, I mean, I'm given certain elements, g1, g2, da, 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 gn. And now I want to use these g sub i's to get a simpler coset representative. Okay, so let's think about it and how we can, and what the problem is and how we can achieve it. So the following lemma is an indication of how, how one can formulate this type of question. And it is, in some sense, the easiest version of the future results that we are going to prove. But it's a good indication. It's a good indicator of how we can formulate these type of questions and what kind of, uh, what, what we can mean, what we mean by a generalized long division. So suppose I give you a, not a single polynomial, but rather n polynomials in a bracket x. So g1, g2, da, 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 gn. So when n was one, when I was given 
when I, when I give you only one polynomial, the condition that I impose was that the leading term, uh, the leading coefficient is a unit. So alternatively, I can say that the ideal generated by the leading term is the entire ring capital A. Now I give you n polynomials in A bracket X, and I give you the same type of condition. So I tell you that the ideal generated by the leading terms of GIs is the entire ring A. Now can I produce a generalized division algorithm for these G sub i's? And the answer is yes, but in what sense? In the following sense, whatever polynomial you give me, I can always find a remainder such that degree of the remainder is strictly less than the max of the degree of GIs. I cannot go beyond the maximum. So it can go strictly less than the maximum of the degree of GIs so that F and R represent the same cosets modulo the ideal generated by G sub I's. So I can I can do the same process to get a coset representative modulo the ideal generated by G sub I's, which is a, which is a simple form, meaning the degree is strictly less than degree, the maximum of the degree of the generators. If you think about it, this lemma when for n equals to one gives us back the existence part of long division. So when n is 1, this lemma tells me that I can always find some coset representative whose degree is less than degree of g. So and when I say coset representative, that means f minus r is g times q for some q. So it does give me the existence part of long division. But let's see how the proof goes. The proof is kind of identical to the long division algorithm, we are going to write down an algorithm, a pseudo algorithm, and then we, so, we, sh we show that and this algorithm terminates and along the way, um, we are not going to leave the coset that's represented by F modulo the ideal generated by GIs. So we are going to make sure that each time the new F that I'm giving minus the old one is going to be inside the ideal generator by g sub i's and i decrease the degree of f so that way i am still in the coset i am still in the coset till i reach to this barrier okay so let's look at the steps now again the same as before i say if degree of f is already strictly less than max of the degree of g sub i's just return f as my remainder now, if degree of f is at least the maximum, now I'm going to try to clean up and reduce the degree. So I'm going to look at the leading term of f and then clean it up. But how can I do it? I'm going to show that the leading term of f so in, when n is 1, we discussed that leading term would be in the ideal generator, would be a multiple of leading term of g. Now we have n terms. We are going to show that the leading term of f belongs to the ideal generated by leading terms of g sub i's. Why is that the case? Leading term has x part and leading coefficient. Let's start with leading coefficient. Leading coefficient of f being an element of the ring capital A can be written as, a, as an A linear combination of leading, term, leading coefficients of G sub i's because of our assumption. Our assumption is that the ideal generated by the leading coefficients is the entire ring capital A. So whatever element I give you in the ring capital A, we can write it as an A linear combination of the, of the leading coefficients of g sub i. So again, we have this because the leading 
uh, term of f belongs to the ideal generated by leading, leading terms of g sub i's. So again, because I have this inclusion, I can write it as an a linear combination of these uh, terms. Now that I have the leading coefficient, I need to match the x part. The leading coefficient, the leading term of g1 has already x to power degree of g1 in, its, in itself times the leading coefficient. So in order to match the x part of it, I need to multiply it by x raised to power degree of f minus degree of g1. And we notice by our assumption, degree of f is at least degree of g1. So it does make sense to write down x raised to, to this power because this is a non-negative integer. So I look at this monomial a1 and match the x part. I do the same for the other gi's. And I take these a sub i's from this equation. So I do it for g2, I do it for, a, for gn. So I match the x, the x part and multiply it by a sub n. And I look at this summation. And I notice that I have already matched the x parts. And then I need to add the coefficients. And when I add the coefficients using this, I, I get precisely the leading coefficient of f. So altogether, I get that this particular a bracket s x linear combination of the leading terms of g sub i's give me the leading term of f. In fact, we don't need to work with an arbitrary uh, element of a bracket x as in the quotients. I can only work with monomials. So I can find these monomials a sub i x raised to power degree of f minus degree of g sub i's and use those in order to, to look at the linear combination of the leading terms of g sub i's and end up getting the leading term of f. Now I can look at the old f and subtract out this linear combination of g sub i's. Because of the top equality, the equality that I've written over here, because of this equality, we see that the leading term of the linear combination that I'm subtracting is the same as the leading term of the old f. So when I subtract it out, the leading terms disappear, I get something of a smaller degree, and I put it to be the new one. Now I notice two properties of the new f. So first of all, because of this argument that I mentioned, because the leading term of this is the same as the leading term of the polynomial that I'm subtracting, I deduce that the degree of the new f is strictly less than degree of the old f. And the second thing that we notice is that the new one minus the old one is a linear combination of g sub i's with coefficients in a bracket x. That means that this difference belongs to the ideal generated by g1 to the dot gn. That means they are giving me the same cosets. So that's exactly what I promised. Along this algorithm, uh, I'm not leaving the coset represented by f, and I'm reducing the degree of the coset representative. So this algorithm terminates because at some point, the degree of this coset representative would be smaller than the max of the degree of g sub i's, and I get the desired uh, r. So we get the coset representative whose degree is strictly less than the max of the degree of g sub i's. So th this type of um, algorithm, I'm going to refer to, I'm going to refer to this type of algorithm as generalized long division. This is a particular case of it where I'm imposing this strong condition that the leading coefficient of g sub i's generate the entire ring capital A. But what if this ideal is not uh, the entire A? 
then what can I say? That's one of the questions. The other question is, of course, uh, similar to uh, f bracket x, we use this long division to find a cos uh, to to find a nice cos representative for an arbitrary ideal i, and then use this to show that an arbitrary ideal i is principal. Now, can we find a nice cos representative of f bracket of of f plus i for an arbitrary ideal i? under certain assumptions, of course. So these are the type of questions that we want to address. And we see that in this, uh, in this algorithm, the key properties are, are essentially these two. So either I can say that, so this was, this played an important role that the leading coefficient of F belongs to the ideal generated by the leading coefficient of G sub i's. Or I can say that this used, we use this in order to get this result. If I tell you that the leading term of F belongs to the ideal generated by the leading terms of G sub i's, then of course I can run this algorithm as we have over here. So it seems that these are the two key properties in this algorithm. So we can impose these conditions and try to see what kind of results we end up getting. Let's start with the first one. So let's, let's see how we can formulate a result where this condition plays an important role. I'm going to refer to, to this result as a generalized long division, the ideal format. But so in general, this type of arguments I'm going to refer to generalized long division, but this lemma in particular is going to be of uh, importance. So suppose A is a unital commutative ring and I give you an ideal in A bracket X. Again, I'm working towards um, uh, trying to understand ideals of A bracket X. And I give you a bunch of elements, you wanted the dot gn inside this ideal. Now, let's assume that for every f that you give me inside this ideal, the leading term of f is already in the ideal generated by the leading terms of g sub i's. So this holds in the previous lemma. Because there, I'm assuming that this is the entire ring. Now I'm weakening that limb. I'm giving you this ideal, but then my condition is only about elements of this ideal. And I'm telling you that the leading terms are already generated by the leading terms of G sub i. In that case, I can find a remainder. I can find a remainder for dividing by G sub i's. I can find some element within the ideal i that you are giving me so that degree of r is a strictly less than the max of the degree of G sub i's and f minus r is in the ideal generated by G sub i's. Now, how should you think about this lemma before I get to the proof? So first, this is a very good uh, formulation of a result where you can see the importance of this type of condition. So this type of condition uh, says, if I have certain information about, an, uh, about ideals in A, I can gain information about ideals in A bracket X. So that's, one way of looking at this generalized long division, having certain information for some ideals in A, gaining some information about the ideals in A bracket X. That's one way of thinking about it. The second way, when A was a field, the way that we showed every ideal is a PID was like this. And we picked an element inside this ideal I we divide out by this 
uh, by this element gets something of a smaller degree inside the ideal. Now, by repeating this, we end up getting the smallest degree polynomial inside this ideal, and that one generates the entire ideal. This is how we got um, a generator of the ideal i when a was a field. So if you think about it, now we are doing the same here. Uh, we are starting with g1 dot dot gn and an arbitrary function f within the ideal i, I'm dividing it out to get something smaller. So maybe I can do this process again and get something smaller and smaller, and maybe those smaller guys can help me to generate the entire idea. So that's kind of, um, uh, that's where we are going, finding a set of generators for the ideal i in certain settings. So that's one kind of a statement that, uh, that's related to the first type of condition. Now, the second type of condition, can I formulate a result that relies on this type of condition? Okay, so this lemma, the next lemma, so I'm going to write down these statements and then I'm going to the proof of these uh, lemmas. Now, the second type is actually cleaner. It says that if I give you an ideal in A bracket X, and I give you polynomials in this ideal, G1, G2, da, 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 Gn, I tell you that I have managed to generate all the possible leading terms using the leading terms of G sub i's. So for every F inside the ideal, the leading term of F is, is in the ideal generated by the leading terms of G sub i's. If this is the case, then G i's generate the entire ideal. So all of a sudden, we are saying in order to generate an ideal, it's enough to generate all the, deal, all the leading terms using the leading terms of my, my possible generators. So if the leading terms of G sub i's generate all the needed leading terms, then G sub i's generate the ideal. So it's, it's a quite interesting result. Again, leading terms are monomials. So they have some x part and leading coefficients. So this condition is, is very close to um, a condition about ideals inside the ring A. So even though still I'm working in A bracket X, but it is about a single monomial, which makes it very close to something inside A. Of course, there are X parts as well that one needs to be very careful about. But this lemma tells me as soon as I can find, I can generate all the leading terms, then I can generate the entire ID. Okay, let's see. Uh, let's start with the proof of generalized long division, and then we go and, sh and see why the leading terms are enough to be generated. Okay, so it's, the proof is quite identical to the proof of the previous generalized long division where the ideal generated by all the leading, term, leading coefficients uh, was the entire ring of coefficients capital A. So we are going to follow this algorithm and that uh, if the degree of F is already strictly less than the max of degree of G sub i's, we are done and we return F as our remainder. Otherwise, we try to clean up the leading term of F. So suppose degree of F is at least maximum of degree of G sub i's. Now I want to match the leading term of f. So similar to the previous case, I need to work with the leading coefficients. Here the assumption is that f is inside i. So by our hypothesis, we already know that the leading 
coefficient of f is in the ideal generated by the leading coefficient of g sub i, which means the leading coefficient of f can be written as an a linear combination of leading coefficient of g sub i. Now I can use these sub i, c sub i, and use the assumption that degree of f is at least degree of g sub i to match the x part. So here m is degree of f, m sub i is degree of g sub i, and remember m is at least m sub i. So these are non-negative integers. So it does make sense to talk about x raised to power m minus m sub i. Now these x powers match the x part of this term and this monomial, when I multiply them, they match the degree of the monomial leading term of f. And these c sub i's, when I multiply them by the leading term of g sub i's and add them, I, they match the leading co coefficient of f because of this equality. So altogether, we get this equality that the leading term of f is this particular linear combination of leading terms of g sub i's. So I can repeat the previous algorithm, meaning I let the new f to be the old one minus this particular linear combination, a bracket x combination of g sub i's. Because of this star, because of this equality, we know that the leading term of this thing that I'm subtracting is the same as the leading term of the old f. When I subtract them, the new one is going to have smaller degree. Now, the thing that I'm subtracting, this guy, belongs to the ideal generated by g sub one that the g sub n. That means the coset that the new one represents modulo this ideal is the same as the old one. So I'm, I'm not leaving, uh, I'm not leaving the coset uh, represented by F modulo the ideal generated by G sub I's. I'm always in the same coset. Within that coset, I'm reducing my, uh, the degree of my coset representative. And finally, because my initial coset representative belongs to I and this is a subset of I, this, the entire coset that I'm working with is a subset of I. So that means the new F that we are getting is still inside I. So alternatively, I can say the old one was inside I and the G sub I's are inside I and therefore the new one is also inside I. So within this algorithm, I'm not leaving I, I'm not leaving the coset represented by F modulo the ideal generated by G sub one that is G sub N, and I am reducing the degree of uh, coset representatives. So that means the whole process, the whole algorithm terminates, and the outcome has the desired properties. The outcome R is going to be in the same coset as F modulo the ideal generated by u sub i's, it's going to be inside i and it's going to have degree strictly less than the maximum of degree of g sub i's. That's exactly what we were looking for. Okay, now we are done with the uh, what we call generalized long division. Now let's go and uh, see why it's enough to generate leading terms of an ideal using leading terms of our possible generators. So again, this is what we want to show. I is an ideal of A bracket X. The assumption is that for every G that you give me inside this ideal, the leading term of G belongs to the ideal generated by the leading terms of G sub I's. From here, I want to deduce that I is generated by G sub i's. Okay, so um, let's see how the proof goes. It's kind of similar to the previous arguments with a bit of subtlety. I will point it out when we reach to it. 
So uh, because G sub i's are inside the ideal i, clearly the ideal generated by G sub i's is a subset of i. So this part is easy. I want to show the other way around, but let me reduce the noise. Okay, so now I want to show the other way around, meaning I'm going to start with an element of the ideal i, and I want to show that it belongs to the ideal generated by g sub i's. So f is inside i, and I'm going to produce an algorithm. And this algorithm is going to reduce the degree of f among the coset representatives uh, of f plus modulo the ideal generated by g sub i's. And I show that this process actually terminates with zero. And therefore, uh, f should belong to the ideal generated by g sub i's. So the, I, the idea is similar as before. This time, however, I'm, I'm, there is not going to be any condition and um, any step one condition, so any condition and the degrees. We show that we can always clean up the leading term of f, and at the end, we end up getting with the zero polynomial. So let's go through the argument. So I start with this polynomial f, and uh, we are essentially using a strong induction on the degree of f to show that f belongs to the ideal generated by g sub 1 dot g sub n. Okay, so that means it's enough to subtract f by something in the ideal generated by g sub i's and reduce its degree. As soon as I do that, I can use the induction hypothesis, strong induction hypothesis, and finish in the proof. Now, I want to clean up the leading term of f, but what do I know? What is my hypothesis? By hypothesis, I do know that the leading term of f does belong to the ideal generated by the leading terms of g sub i's. So the idea is write it as a linear combination in a bracket x and try to subtract. The only subtle thing is that here, because these coefficients q sub i's are not monomials necessarily, I have to be careful. I cannot simply subtract and say that uh, I'm not introducing new leading terms. Right? So I have to make sure that these uh, subtraction that I'm introducing actually has a smaller degree. So I have to make sure that I'm not introducing larger terms in my um, linear combination. So that's what I'm going to argue. In fact, I'm going to say that if a monomial is in the ideal generated by other monomials, then it can be written as a, as a linear combination of, uh, with coefficients that are monomial as well. So I want to say I can replace q sub i's by monomials. That's going to be uh, our uh, first step, an important step. We are going to come back to this type of statement later not in today's lecture, but later uh, we'll come back to this type of uh, argument. Uh, ideals that are generated by monomials play an important role, as you can see. So by hypothesis, the leading term of F is an A bracket X linear combination of leading terms of G sub I's. That means for some polynomials q sub i, we have this equality. Now, suppose degree of f is m and degree of g sub i's are m sub i's. That means, that means what? So this is a single, uh, sing this is a monomial. It has only one term. This has only one term. q sub i's might have multiple terms, but the only relevant term is going to be the term that after multiplication by the leading term of g sub i matches the degree of leading term of f. 
So this means the only relevant term of Q sub i is the term that has degree m minus m sub i. If m minus m sub i is a negative number, that means I can just write down c sub i to be zero. If it's a non-negative number, whatever coefficient q sub i has, I put it there. So it's essentially the term that is relevant for the left-hand side and the rest of the terms inside q sub i. So I'm, I'm singling out the, the term that has m minus one, m minus m sub i degree in q sub i. And q sub i bar consists of those uh, terms that do not have degree m minus m sub i. Now, because of this kind of splitting, the only terms that are relevant in this summation are the ones that, are, that I have separated out. The other terms, when I multiply them by the leading terms of g sub i's and add them, that the whole summation do not have a degree m degree m term. So when I consider this, and as I distribute, this binomial do not have x to power m in it. This binomial do not have x to power m in it. So when I add them, there is no x to power m in this summation. But on the other hand, the whole summation plus some other terms of degree m is supposed to be the leading term of f. That means this summation is zero. Again, because pay attention, whatever this summation is plus this one, th these are the, the terms that I have singled out from q sub i. So this summation plus this summation is supposed to be the leading term of f. This summation is, is going to be a single monomial of degree m. This summation has no degree m terms. And this equality over here is an equality over ring of polynomials. This means that all the coefficients should be the same. Because this site has no uh, term of degree different from m, and this part consists of all the terms that have degree different from m, we get that this summation should be zero. So altogether, we, uh, we are writing the leading term of f as a monomial linear combination of leading terms of g sub i's. Having this kind of monomial linear combination of leading terms of g sub i's, we are in a good position to, to go through the previous algorithm, meaning I'm just going to consider f minus uh, this linear combination of g sub i's that, that are coming from these monomials. So I look at this linear combination of g sub i's and I notice that degree of each one of these terms is at most m, right? Because m sub i is degree of g sub i. So when I multiply them, I get at most and degree m. And notice that if m is, uh, if m is less than m sub i for some i, C sub i was supposed to be zero. So those, that term do not appear at all anyway. So altogether we get that the degree of this side cannot be more than m, but at the same time, the degree m term cancels out because of this equality over here. So altogether we get that this new f that I'm giving you, this f bar that I'm defining over here is of a smaller degree. because the leading term of this one matches the leading term of what I'm subtracting. So I'm getting something smaller and at the same time, F bar being um, in the ideal generated by F and G sub i's. So it's a linear combination of F and G sub i's and F and G sub i's are inside the ideal i. We did use that this new polynomial which is of a smaller degree is also inside 
i, and that is crucial in addition is that f bar minus f is in the ideal generated by g sub i's, because what I'm subtracting belongs to the ideal generated by g sub i's. Again, I'm not leaving the coset represented by f modulo the ideal generated by g sub i's. Therefore, I'm still inside i and so on. So I can repeat this process, or I can just use strong induction hypothesis and deduce that f bar belongs to the ideal generated by g sub i's. And because f and f bar represented the same coset, we deduce that f belongs to the ideal generated by g sub i's. This completes the proof of this lemma. So altogether, we proved that if the leading terms of g sub i's generate all the leading terms of elements in a given ideal, and g sub i's belong to that ideal, then g sub i's generate the entire ideal. So we are getting closer and closer to finding a generating set for an ideal uh, of a bracket x, a finite generating set for such a thing. But I mean, in order to do so, we need to find, we need to work with, uh, so we need to generate leading terms or we need to generate leading coefficients, but are they ideals in general? So the next lemma actually gives us a way of getting ideals of the ring capital A for a given ideal in A bracket X using the leading coefficients and so on. So let's look at the next lemma. So again, what we are heading to is um, getting under suitable assumptions, we are going to find, we are going to show that every ideal of A bracket X is finitely generated. We will formulate it correctly as we get uh, to the right place, but this is where we are getting to. So suppose A, uh, suppose I is an ideal of A bracket X. Now I can look at all the leading terms so leading terms by definition are non-zero. So I am going to add zero to this set as well. So I'm going to look at the union of all the leading terms, a union zero, and I call it the leading, the set of leading terms of I, L D of I. I can also focus only on the polynomials that have degree M within I. So I look at the leading terms of F in I that have degree m. And by definition, zero is not going to be there, I include zero. And I denote this set by else LD sub m of i, the leading terms of polynomials of degree m in i. And claiming that both of these are ideals of the ring of coefficients. So this is an ideal of a, and this is an ideal for every non-negative integer m. So for instance, for m equals to zero, I'm looking at what are the constant polynomials that are inside i and so on. Okay, let's see why these are ideals. The proofs um, is actually, the proof of this lemma is fairly easy, but let's go through the argument. So I wanna show that these uh, sets are ideals. I need to show that they are closed under addition and closed under scalar multiplication. Let's start with addition. So suppose C1 and C2 are two elements in the set of leading terms, leading coefficients of I. That means they are leading coefficients of some elements of the ideal capital I, which means I can find F1 and F2 in I, in the ideal I, so that the leading term of these polynomial is this constant C sub I times some power of x. I want to work with c1 plus c2. I want to show that c1 plus c2 is also a leading term inside this ideal. But unfortunately, I cannot simply add f1 and f2 because the terms, these polynomials do not have the same degree. So when I add them, the leading terms do not necessarily add up. 
So the first thing that we need is to level them. So we need to make sure that uh, they have the same degree. So that's rather easy. How? We take the max and then uh, multiply one of them by a power of x to level them up and then add. So let's, let's do that. So first thing that we notice that if c1 plus c2 is already 0, then we are done. Because the summation belongs, 0 belongs to this set. So if it is 0, we are done. So let's assume that it is not 0. Then I'm going to look at the degrees, match them, meaning I look, multiply the one that has a smaller degree by appropriate power of x and put it in the same level. Now, x to power m2 minus m1 times f1 has degree precisely m2. The leading term of this product is the leading coefficient is c1 times x to power m2. And the leading term of f2 is, is c2 times x to power m2. So all the other terms in this summation have a smaller degree. And the largest term is precisely this one. And because I'm assuming c1 plus c2 is not zero, this actually doesn't disappear. So it is indeed the leading term of this polynomial. And because f1 and f2 are in the ideal i, this also belongs to the ideal i. So altogether, we get that c1 plus c2 is either 0 or the leading coefficient of this polynomial that belongs to i. And in either case, we deduce that c1 plus c2 belongs to the, uh, belongs to the I, uh, leading terms of ideal i. Okay, now we show that it is closed under addition. Let's see why it is closed under scalar multiplication. I pick some element inside the ring capital A. I mean, I want to show A times C1 belongs to the same set, the leading terms, the leading coefficients of I. So if A times C1 is zero, we are done. It is inside this set anyway. Now assume that it's not zero, then when I multiply f1 by a, clearly the leading coefficient of this polynomial would be a times c1. So there, therefore, a times c1 is inside the set of leading terms of i. So with this 1 and 2, we deduce that this is an ideal of uh, the ring a. The other one is actually easier because for the other one, we do not need to level up uh, the polynomials, I can simply add them. So if C1 and C2 are in uh, LD sub M of I, that means I have polynomials of degree M in I. I have F1 and F2 in I, where the leading term of Fi is C sub I times X to the M. So this, it should be precisely that one. M is the same. Now we can simply add them. And notice that if c1 plus c2 is 0, I'm done. Otherwise, the leading term of the summation would be precisely sum of the coefficients times x to the m. So I'm getting a, another polynomial of degree m inside the, ideal gen, inside the ideal i with leading coefficient c1 plus c2. So c1 plus c2, in either case, uh, belongs to um, Ld sub m of i. Now I need to argue why it is closed under scalar multiplication, and it's an identical argument. So either a times c1 is 0, in which case we are done. Otherwise, the leading term of a times f1 is a c1 x to the m, which means that a times f1 is of degree m, and its leading term is a c1, its leading coefficient is a times c1. So in either case, a c1 belongs to the set Ld sub m of, a, uh, of i. So we deduce that this is an ideal um, of the ring capital A. OK, now we are in a good stage, a good uh, 
place to formulate and the result that we are uh, we have been working towards as i've mentioned we are trying to show that under suitable assumptions every ideal of a bracket x is finitely generated let's recall that a ring is Noetherian precisely when every ideal of that ring is finitely generated. So, um, when I say under suitable assumptions, we want to show every ideal of A bracket X is finitely generated, I am telling you that we want to find, we want to formulate a result um, where under suitable assumptions, we end up getting that A bracket X is a Noetherian ring. Okay, so the, the segment is precisely this. I mean, it's not surprising that if A bracket X is Noetherian, then A should be also Noetherian. It's a good exercise, try to show this direction. But uh, the, the next theorem is the important result, which is the converse of the system. If A is Noetherian, then A bracket X is Noetherian. So that's called Hilbert's basis theorem. This basis is different from the basis from the vector spaces and so on. Uh, it's kind of, uh, so at the time for a generating set of an ideal, they, uh, the word basis had been used as well. Um, so Hilbert showed that uh, if A is Noetherian, then every ideal of A bracket X ha can be generated by finitely many polynomials. So that means A bracket X is also Noetherian. So that's called Hilbert's basis theorem. If A is Noetherian and you're in a unit of commutative ring, then uh, if A is Noetherian, then A bracket X is also Noetherian. That's an important result. Uh, we are going to use it um, later as well. Let's see how the proof goes. So I want to show that every ideal of A bracket X is finitely generated. By the lemma that we proved, if I want to generate I by G1 data dot GN, it's enough to show that the leading terms of elements of I can be generated by the leading terms of finitely many elements. So this turns our task to showing that the set of all leading terms of a given uh, ideal i uh, can be generated by finitely many elements. So that's our goal. We want to show we can find g1 data dot gn so that so it's enough to show the following lemma, that if A is a Noetherian unital commutative ring and I is an ideal, then if I look at the ideal generated by all the leading terms, this is a finitely generated ideal. So I can find G sub I's inside the ideal I and generate this using the leading terms of G sub I's. So if we show this lemma, then um, by the previous statements that I've mentioned, by the previous lemma, uh, we can deduce that G sub i's generate the ideal i, and that shows that i is finitely generated. So our goal is to show this lemma, that I can generate all the leading terms. Okay, so, but what is my assumption? My assumption is about the ring of coefficients. So uh, instead of working with leading terms, I can work with leading coefficients. Leading coefficients is an ideal of A. Therefore, it's a finitely generated ideal because I assume that A is Noetherian. So this is a finitely generated ideal, which means this can be generated by leading terms of finitely many elements of the ideal i. So I can find f1, f2, da, 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 fm inside the ideal i and generate the entire 
leading terms of i. Now, now we are in the setting of generalized long division. We are given an ideal, finitely many elements inside this ideal, and all the leading terms are generated by the leading terms of f sub i's. It's exactly the setting of generalized long division. What was the, what was the conclusion of generalized long division? The conclusion of generalized long division was that whatever you give me inside the ideal i, I can reduce its degree within the coset of f and the ideal generated by f1 to the dot fm. So let's write it precisely. So suppose f belongs to i and its degree is at least the max of the degree of f sub i's. What we showed in the generalized long division was that I can find, I can generate its leading term using the leading terms of f sub i's. So we argued this and then we subtract this and then we proceeded by the, by the algorithm that we had. But at this point, we want to only work with the leading coefficients. That's why I focus only on the leading term, not the leading coefficient. We want to focus on leading terms. That's why I just work uh, with the essential step in the proof of generalized long division. The essential step said that if f belongs to this ideal and its degree is at least the maximum of degree of f sub i's, then the leading term of f can be mapped, matched by a linear combination, a bracket x combination of leading terms of f sub i's. So in this case, we are fine. So if, if degree of f is large, we are in this finitely generated ideal. So we are in good setting. So this means I need to focus on those polynomials inside i that have degree less than this. Can I generate the leading terms of those polynomials using only finitely many elements of the ideal i? So that's the question that we need to address. So again, I need to work with polynomials that are inside i and whose degree is strictly less than the maximum of degree of f sub i's. If it is more than that, we are, we are fine. If it is less than that, I have to find, find a way to generate the leading term of f. Okay, so now the good thing is the degree is bounded. The degree of such a thing is varying from one, from zero to k. So actually maybe I have to change this to zero, from zero to k. Now I focus on the leading terms of a polynomial of degree i. Again, by the lemma that we have, if I focus on those polynomials that have degree i and I look at their leading coefficients and union zero, I will get an ideal of the, lead, of the ring of coefficients. My assumption, A is an Ethereum. That means this ideal is finitely generated. So again, let's think about it. I'm using F sub i's that initially I got that generate the entire uh, leading uh, coefficients of the ring i. I'm using those to clean up very large degree polynomials and reduce them and make them smaller degree. So that's, that's the idea. So essentially I'm saying, so I want to generate the entire, uh, the, every element, uh, every leading term of elements of i. If f has large degree, I can, I can just use these f sub i's and use this star and generate the leading term of f. But if the degree of f is the smaller than the maximum of these degree of these ones, f i's cannot help me 
I need a new element inside I that can uh, generate the leading term of F. So for those ones, I'm doing the next step. For every I from zero till this max degree, I look at the ideal of A that comes from the leading terms, leading coefficients of polynomials of degree I inside the ideal capital I. Because A is Noetherian, this is a finitely generated ideal, which means I can find finitely many polynomials inside the ideal capital I that have degree small i and they, their leading term generate, their leading coefficient generate and this ideal LD sub i of capital I. Now my claim is that this is good enough for us to get the claim. So now I want to pass from leading terms to le from leading coefficients to leading terms. So here, the equality that I have is at the level of leading coefficients. Now I want to pass to leading terms. And the key point is that now these guys, all of them have the same degree. So it's, it should not be hard to pass from the leading coefficients to leading terms. So again, this is what I want to show that if f is inside this ideal and its degree is fixed and it is i, which is smaller than k, then the leading term of f is in the ideal generated by the corresponding leading terms. Again, uh, because the degrees i and it is inside this ideal, the leading coefficient belongs to this ideal and therefore it is generated by the leading coefficients of f sub i1, f sub i2 and so on and that means an a linear combination of these elements give me the leading term, the leading coefficient of f. Now I simply multiply both sides by x to power m, x to power i. When I multiply both sides by x to power i, because f is of degree i, and these polynomials are of degree i as well, I get that the leading term of f is the same as this a linear combination of leading terms of f sub ij's. All of a sudden we are getting the claim, we are getting that the leading term of f is inside the ideal generated by these leading terms. So we are done because if f is a larger degree, if the degree of f is at least k, then the leading term of f belongs, then leading term of f belongs to the ideal generated by the leading terms of f1 dot dot fm. If the degree of f is smaller than k, then it should belong to the ideal generated by the leading terms of fij's. So if I put f sub i's and f sub ij's together, then we deduce that for every f inside this ideal, the leading term of f belongs to the ideal generated by the leading terms of f sub i's and leading terms of f sub ij's as i varies from zero to k and j varies from one to i, uh, n sub i. So these ones can help us to, to deal with a smaller degree polynomials and these ones can help us to, to deal with larger degree polynomials. All together, we get that all the leading terms um, appear in this finitely generated ideal and therefore by a lemma that we had earlier, uh, these polynomials f1 dot dot, dot fm, f sub ij's generate the entire ideal i. That completes the proof. That shows that every ideal in a bracket x is finitely generated. And so Hilbert spaces theorem uh, is deduced. Hilbert spaces theorem 
is crucial, it's important result. It, it shows us that a lot of rings that we have been working with are nefarian. For instance, using this inductively, I can deduce that if A is nefarian, then the ring of polynomials, multivariate polynomials with coefficients inside A is also nefarian. It's a simple induction. I add one variable at a time because, um, so if n is zero, there is nothing to prove because I is nefarian. Otherwise, I go to the induction step. Uh, and by the induction hypothesis, this is nefarian. I want to add one more variable, but this is a nefarian ring. When I add one more variable, it is just nefarian because of the Hilbert spaces theorem. So that's how we can, we can use simple induction to show that multivariable polynomials with coefficients inside the nefarian ring are nefarian. Uh, as a consequence, the ring of polynomials with coefficients in the ring of integers, multivariable polynomials, uh, or multivariable polynomials with coefficients inside a field, both of them are nefarian. And this is because Z is a PID, it's nefarian, and F is a field. It has only two uh, ideas, zero and the entire thing. So it is also nefarian. So because Z and a field are Noetherian by the previous corollary, we deduce that these rings are Noetherian. Now, this corollary is important because this shows that every finitely generated ring and every finitely generated F algebra is Noetherian. But I have to tell you what I mean by finitely generated ring and finitely generated F algebra. So let's define these uh, notions, this notion. Um, yeah, and then uh, we formulate the statement that I just mentioned. What does finitely generated ring means? So let's, let's still work with unital commutative rings. So such a ring we call a finitely generated ring, or we say A is finitely generated. If I can find finitely many elements inside this ring, so that the smallest subring of capital A that contains these elements is the entire ring capital A. Alternatively, what does that mean? So if I give you A1, A2, da da da, da AN inside this ring, and I want to create a subring out of them, I have to add, I have to subtract, I have to multiply. It's like taking a polynomial of A sub i with coefficients inside z. But z, what I mean by z is working with the unit, unity, the identity of the ring A. So we've seen this map long ago that sends m to m times one from z to A. So we use this to also define the characteristic of a ring A. You've seen that this is a ring homomorphism. So either it gives us a copy of Z inside A, or um, if the characteristic is, is not zero, it gives us Z sub K inside A. But whatever polynomial in terms of A sub I that I give you, um, with coefficients inside the image of this ring, image of this ring, would be uh, a subset of A, and any subring that contains A sub I should contain these. And vice versa, if I just work with these uh, polynomials in terms of A sub I, uh, that form a ring. So that means that's an alternative way of thinking about it. When I say a ring is finitely generated, it's essentially this. It's generated by, uh, it, this is a polynomial values at A sub i's. I'm going to formulate this in a more precise way. But let's define what is a finitely generated F algebra. When we say F algebra, I'm going to make it, uh, I'm going to only work with uh, F algebras where F is a field. It essentially means that F is embedded inside this ring. So an F algebra, a finitely generated F algebra is of this form. I have a copy of F inside A and they share their identity. 
And when I say finitely generated, it means I can find a1 da da dot a n inside this ring so that the smallest sub ring of this ring that contains a sub i's and this field f is the entire ring a. In that case, we write down a is f bracket a1 da da dot a n. So now I can formulate that polynomial um, values that I mentioned earlier. So essentially we are looking, looking at the uh, evaluation map from the ring of polynomials from the, uh, from the ring of uh, polynomials with coefficients inside Z, multivariable polynomials to the ring A by evaluating a given multivariable polynomial at a1 the dot, dot a n. Now with the subtlety that I have mentioned earlier as well, that the coefficients, they cannot be inside Z anymore. I have to put it, put it in the copy of Z or the quotient of Z inside the ring A via the map that sends N to N times one. So this is a ring homomorphism. And then I'm look, looking at the composite of this ring homomorphism and evaluation map. So it's not hard to see that this is indeed uh, a ring homomorphism. And because I'm sending X i's to A sub i's, the image of this ring homomorphism contains A sub i. And every uh, sub ring of capital A that contains A sub i should contain this. So image of this is precisely um, the smallest sub ring of capital A that contains A sub i's. When I say it's generated by these A sub i's, it's the same as saying that this map is surjective. So I'm giving you a surjective ring homomorphism from the ring of polynomials with coefficients inside Z to my finitely generated ring. Now, when I tell you that A is, finite, uh, is a finitely generated F algebra, we are in, this, in a similar setting, but this time from the ring of polynomials with coefficients inside F to A, and I'm simply evaluating a polynomial at a sub i's. It's easy to see both of these statements that I'm giving you surjective ring homomorphisms from these finitely generated and from this multivariable ring of polynomials to this uh, either finitely generated ring or finitely generated F algebra. Now we deduce this important corollary of Hilbert spaces theorem that if A is a finitely generated ring or a finitely generated F algebra, then A is a Noetherian. This, and the reasoning being that by the previous lemma, A is a quotient of either ring of polynomials with coefficients inside Z, if it's a finitely generated ring, or a quotient of ring of polynomials with coefficients inside F, then it's, an, it's a finitely generated F algebra. Uh, but these rings are Noetherian, and we know quotients of Noetherian rings are Noetherian. So that completes the proof. So next we will see how we can uh, understand um, or try to understand uh, zeros of multivariate polynomials using uh, these type of generalized division algorithms for multivariate polynomials.